And good evening, everyone. Good evening. Let's take our Bibles, please, and find the book of Revelation, chapter 14. Revelation, chapter 14. Remember, this is a continuation of the parenthetical chapters beginning in chapter 12, 13, and 14. And then in chapter 15, the narrative continues on to chapter number 20. So let's get these verses ahead of us and beginning in verse number six. So we have a series of angels showing up and uh, then we are going to see that God is going to rescue the world. Remember, man has ruined the world. Satan has tried to rule the world. He ruined it also. And the Lord comes to our rescue or to the rescue of the world. We'll be gone. The church will be gone. We won't be here. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, verse 6, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. Well, what's the message? Saying with a loud voice, fear God. Now, the word fear God doesn't mean we're afraid of God. It means we reverence him and honor him. And give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. That great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her Fornication, Of course, that's spiritual fornication. And the third angel followed, saying with a loud voice. Now notice when these angels appear to the earth to talk about God's judgment, they're speaking with a loud voice. That's the voice of warning. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark, in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he should be tormented with fire and brimstone and the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascended up forever and ever, no annihilation there. And they have no rest, day nor night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Herein is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, and I notice this is not a loud voice, write, blessed, now he's talking to John, the beloved disciple who's exiled on the Isle of Patmos, who's writing this information for us. Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors. Now you're noticing a contrast between the ungodly and the godly. No rest to the ungodly. However, there is a rest to the children of God. And their works do follow them. And I looked, and behold, a white cloud. Now here is a picture of the battle or the conquest of Armageddon. That, of course, is the Mount of Slaughter, is what Armageddon means. And I looked, and behold, a white cloud. Upon the cloud one sat like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. Remember, now, this is future. John is giving us a panorama of this parenthetical portion of chapters 12, 13, and 14 of what's coming down the road. 
And another angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud. Thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time has come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. Another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. Another angel came out from the altar, which had power over fire, and cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle, and gather the cluster of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. The angel thrust in his sickle under the earth, and gathered the fine of the earth, and cast it into a great wine press of the wrath of God. And the wine press was trotted without the city, and blood came out of the wine press. This is very gory and very horrible information, but necessary. And the and blood came out of the wine press, not grape juice, but blood. Why, this is judgment even under the horse's bridle. Now remember, horses go by hands, how high a horse is, how tall it is. So you think about the horse's bridle down to the ground. So by the space of 1,600 furlongs, just think now how long this trail of blood is. And then let's get into chapter 15 because there's only eight brief verses, but this begins the narrative again and we'll have the introduction of the final seven vials. Remember, we've had seven seals, seven trumpets. Seven seals, of course, is man, <coughs> man's ruining the earth. Seven trumpets are Satan ruling the earth. Now God comes in rescue of the earth with seven vials. And you think of a vial and you think, I, I have the impression of a scientist in a lab and he's pouring the vials or she's pouring the vials. And of course, the mixture in this case is without mixture, no grace, no mercy now. Someone says the wheels of the Lord run slowly, but they run. Remember, God is long-suffering. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. There's a time when God draws an imaginary line in the sand, and then he says, that's it. And that's what we're seeing now. And I saw a sign in heaven. Remember, chapter 14 is a series of seven signs. And I saw a sign in heaven, great and marvelous. What is the sign? seven angels having the seven last plagues for in them is filled up the wrath of God. Now you think about that. Chapter 14, the wrath of God. Chapter 15, the wrath of God. And as we go on through the book of the Revelation, you find the, the phrase, the wrath of the lamb. He came the first time lowly on a donkey. He's coming the second time with great glory and power the Lord Jesus Christ, and he's coming with judgment. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast, over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. Here's music. And they sung the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways. Isn't this terrible that God would bring wrath upon innocent people? To begin with, they're not innocent people. They're earth dwellers. They're those, these are those who have rejected the Lord. These are those who murdered Christians and now judgment is coming. Just and true are thy ways, thou king of saints. 
Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy. For all nations shall come and worship before thee. For thy judgments are made manifest. And after that I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was open. And the seven angels came out of the temple, having the seven plagues, clothed in pure and white linen, and having their breasts girdled with golden girdles. And one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels, here they are, seven golden vials full of the wrath of God. Over and over and over we're hearing about the wrath of God, who liveth forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke and the glory of God and from his power. And no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. That'll begin in chapter 16. Let's pray. Father, very, very somber and serious ground that we will cover this evening. There are those who say that a God of love surely would not judge anyone. And yet, Father, because you are a God of love, you poured your wrath upon your precious Son so that mankind could have salvation and redemption and that which Adam and Eve lost in the garden could be recovered and reclaimed and they could be born again into your family. But man has been duped. Man has been deceived. Someone has wisely said, a deceived person are not aware that they're being deceived. And the Bible says the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and should be tormented day and night forever and ever. And yet, Lord, that's future. We look forward to that day. But until that day, help us to stay in the battle, not battling one another, but battling our three enemies, the world we live in, the flesh, these bodies, we live in, and the devil who dogs our trail. Bless now the preaching and teaching of your word is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we look, verses 6 through 13, we see the cup of God's wrath poured out. But again, God is long-suffering. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Now you think about that. God is long-suffering. He's a God of grace. His grace is without measure. And we thank the Lord for that. His grace is available. But also, there's a judgment day coming. Nobody gets by. We sometimes think and feel like, why are those people getting by? the people who have murdered in the innocent. Why do preachers get by who are lying to people about the real gospel and what it is? Why do politicians seemingly get by? And, and why do these things happen? Well, God is a God of love. He's a God of mercy. He's a God of grace. But there comes a time when his mercy ends. And God says, that's it. And the day of Jeremiah, Jeremiah, the weeping prophet that prayed, of course, and preached to God's people and the 70 year captivity and that they did not repent. And his heart broke and he wept and uh, looked to the people that they would get right with God, but they would not. But again, God, of course, after the 70 years of captivity brought them out. And of course, Daniel spoke about that. 
And then there came a time, of course, when we think about history, history is all about his story. It's all about him. And we think about history, we realize that, of course, God is writing history every day in the world. And in his history, of course, God is not without a plan. God is not without purpose. And even when we think about salvation, before the foundation of the world, before the world was created, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit got together and they laid out the plan of salvation. And they sent the blessed Lord Jesus Christ who volunteered and said, I'll go, send me. And of course, we're thankful that 2,000 years ago, what we just celebrated a few weeks back, the Christmas time, but the Christmas story is about a babe. Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6, unto us a child is born. That, of course, is the virgin birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Unto us a son is given. That's the vicarious, substitutional death of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. That's future. Uh, that, of course, is the thousand-year millennium reign. But until that thousand-year millennium reign, once Jesus comes for us, he'll meet us in the air. Remember, when Jesus comes again, he's not coming to the earth. He's going to meet us in the air. Nobody, after the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, no lost person ever saw the Lord Jesus. Only God's children saw the Lord Jesus. Remember, on the conclusion of the tribulation and the beginning of the tribulation, which is Daniel's 70th week, does not begin until the rapture of God's children. So good news for us, those of us who know the Lord as Savior, our name has been written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And when Jesus comes and God says, go get my children, be nice if he came today. But when he comes, he's coming for us. Now, there's two ways to go to heaven. <laughs> One way is to go at the rapture. That is when Jesus comes again and we go to heaven without dying. The second way, of course, is the Bible says it's important unto man wants to die. I'm glad it doesn't say it's important unto all man, but it's important unto man who wants to die after this judgment. And then Paul, recording in the book of 1 Corinthians, the resurrection chapter, talks about, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? So the sting, sting of death, of course, is sin. But Paul goes on to say, But thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. And of course, that gift was the Lord Jesus Christ coming and giving his life for us. And that's the good news of the gospel. He died, was buried, and rose again. Now, here comes an angel. You know, the book of Peter says that angels look over the embattlements of heaven and wonder why God would use flesh and blood. Remember, angels are eternal beings. They never die. So the angels are looking over the embattlements of heaven and saying, why would you use flesh and blood? Angels know all about us. Remember, they watch over us. And uh, there is a recording angel that records everything that you and I do and say every day in the world. Somebody said, well, I face God. God, he, he won't know about that. Oh, he knows all about it. Why? An angel's recording everything that we do, good and the bad. And I saw another angel, verse 6, fly in the midst of heaven. So here comes this angel flying. And what does he have? He has the everlasting gospel to preach. He's proclaiming. He's not standing on a pulpit of wood as I am this evening, but he's proclaiming the good news of the gospel. But the gospel that he's talking about here, remember the gospel never changes. Old Testament saints, how are the Old Testament saints saved? They're saying looking to the cross. They're saved looking to the cross, the expectation of Jesus who would come. Isaiah 7, 14, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bring forth the Son, and thou shalt call his name Emmanuel, which is God with us. So they're looking for the Savior. John the Baptist, of course, was baptizing his converts, and he was baptizing them on the matter of baptizing them because they were confessing their sin and looking for the Savior. We're studying the book of Acts on Sunday evenings now. And in Acts chapter 18, where we're at now, we get to the conclusion of that chapter, the end beginning in verse 23, 24. We'll see a fellow by the name of Apollos. And Apollos, of course, was a good and young 
godly man and he preached preached only knowing the baptism of John so remember John was baptizing his converts not that baptism saved them but the baptism was in, was showing that Jesus was going to come and die be buried and rise again from the dead so they were looking to the cross that was future remember Jesus of course hadn't died yet he was there yet and uh, begun his earthly ministry and John the Baptist would look and saw Jesus coming and said behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world and so the Old Testament saints are saved looking to the cross New Testament saints are looking back to the cross as history so the, this angel then is proclaiming the gospel and to them that dwell on the earth, the earth dwellers, giving them an opportunity, giving them, see, God is always long suffering. God is a God of mercy and we thank him for that. But there comes a time as I reiterate when God says that's it. And to every nation, doesn't exclude anybody, and kindred, and tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, fear God. Now he's talking about creation here. God the creator, not Jesus the savior, but God the creator. And give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him. Well, what did he do as the creator? Well, he made heaven and earth. The first book, and the first verse of the first chapter of the first book of the Bible, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That takes away evolution. If men and women would simply believe the first chapter of the Bible and the first verse of the Bible, they could know for sure about going to heaven, and that negates evolution. I mean, if you look at your body and think about that marvelous body that you and I have, uh, that didn't come by evolution. Millions of years, these things happen, and suddenly, here we are. I don't think so. Uh, there was design. You look at a watch. I have a watch. And when you look at this watch uh, and all the working parts in it, uh, somebody didn't just throw some metal together, some springs together, some dials together, and out came a watch. So when we think about our created bodies and how marvelous and how wonderful they are, and even that, uh, one day we're going to die. But as a twice-born child of God, you're going to get a brand new body. A body that's beyond this old, weak, and frail body. And it's going to be likened to his body. And so we thank the Lord for that. And we thank the Lord for the creator. Uh, everything that we see, we think of the constellations. We think of this little speck in the universe called Earth. And uh, realizing that, of course, God made the heavens and the earth and then he made the earth and uh, you and I live on planet earth but there's a whole vast uh, space out there uh, with the Milky Way and the constellations and just amazing and yet God thinks about little old you and little old me what a loving loving heavenly father we have and he created all this for his glory the heavens declare Psalms 19, the glory of God, the earth and the firmament that showeth forth his glory. And you can look up and see a moonless night, and uh, you can see a, a dark night, and then that moon comes out. You can look up and see a dark night, and the stars come out. Wake up in the morning, the east, rising from the east, setting in the west, that wonderful sun, which is a simple star. So we think about creation. We think about light. We think about light. Uh, we, we know about light, but we don't understand light. And so we think about this vast and wonderful universe in this magnificent monarch called our Heavenly Father when we receive him as Savior. And he says that we're fearfully and wonderfully made, Psalms 139. And worship him all through this chapter. And through the book of the Revelation, he's talking about worship. Remember, Satan wants worship. Satan said in Isaiah chapter 7, uh, I will ascend into the stars. I will be like the most high God. Satan wants worship. And the sad thought about that is so many of God's people 
who are deceived, who are duped, and following the devil rather than the Lord. And when we think about that, that will really touch our hearts in the day that we're living in, the time that we're living in. So many of God's people falling away and falling away, and that's called the time of the apostasy, when God's people fall away. And it certainly breaks our heart, but it breaks his heart. And that's why Jesus said, when he comes, will he find any faith? And thank God for your faithfulness. Thank the Lord Wednesday night who wants to come to church on Wednesday night, especially if it's snowing or raining or cold or what have you. And uh, Wednesday night, of course, the middle of the week, it's a time to come and, and be refreshed, to reflect on the things of the Lord. But here this angel is talking about, fear God, who is he? The creator, and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of water. Goodness gracious, if God made this world, you think he can take care of little old you and little old me? Of course he can. And we thank the Lord. And remember the psalmist David wrote, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Now look at verse 8. Verse 8. And there followed another angel. There followed another angel saying Babylon. Now think about that. The first Gentile nation is Babylon. Think about that. Peter was in Babylon. They say that Peter was the first pope of Rome, but that's impossible because Peter never went to Rome. Uh, Peter ends his first, uh, for the book of 1 Peter, which is a book of suffering. 2 Peter, which is a book about false teaching. And Peter ends 1 Peter by saying he was in Babylon. So remember Babylon, we think of Babylon, and we think of Nimrod. Nimrod, of course, in Revelation or Genesis uh, chapter 10, the beginning of Nimrod, and then in chapter 11, and they build a tower. Remember that tower that they built, of course, was a tower that they eventually named Babel. Uh, why was it Babel? Because their God confounded the languages. Because remember, Nimrod, the Bible says he was a mighty hunter, but he was a hunter after flesh, just like Satan. And they were going to build a great tower to heaven. And uh, they were going to have a name. Uh, they were going to have a religion. Uh, they were going to be a people. And God came down and said, is that right? And he confounded their languages. And before you know it, that English man was talking to a Filipino. And that Filipino said, pass me a brick. And he said, I don't understand. And then uh, you think of all the different languages. Uh, that wasn't a blessing. That was a curse. Languages are not a blessing. They're a curse. Now, we're living a time beginning, I guess, back in the 1920s. When a black man in California said that he, he began what's called the Azusa meeting. And he said that the old times of the New Testament, the old time back in the first century, that tongues business, he received the gift of tongues. And uh, they were having meetings. And uh, of course, uh, the gift of tongues to many is jibber jabber. It's just a bunch of jibber jabber. And of course, they had contracted meetings and uh, they would meet together. Then of course, they supposedly had healings, hands that heal. And uh, that, of course, began way back in the 1920s, a Zuzu meeting in California. And then back in the 60s, late 60s and 70s, 70, it began again, the tongues movement. And Bible tongues, and that's why we thank the Lord, we have a Bible. And the Bible talks about tongues over and over. I have one of my Bibles in my study. Uh, every time the word tongue is referenced in the Bible, I've underscored it. Because I was in a church one time and I had a little bit of a cough. <clears throat> I cough tonight. Maybe some of you would run out of church. <laughs> but uh, I have preacher cough. I have it every, every year. And uh, just get a hoarse throat and so forth from preaching. And uh, so I was caught. And these guys said, we want to lay hands on you. I said, you're not touching me. <laughs> one man touching me. And so they said, yeah, we're, we're having a charismatic movement. I had no idea what the word charismatic was or this movement. All I knew, it wasn't, as far as I was concerned, it wasn't of God. And uh, so they... Try to confuse me, and God in his grace, and God in his mercy, this is 1978. And God, of course, showed me through his word that every time the word tongues is mentioned in the Bible, it's a known language. 
So you might ask the question of some dear, and a lot of dear people get duped into the tongues movement, and uh, they talk about, well, uh, do you have the gift of tongues? Well, if you don't have the gift of tongues, you're not saved. Well, of course, I guess I'm not saved because I never got it, never wanted it, and I thought if it was available, and as I studied and looked through the Bible, I underscored it in every reference to the word tongues other than the one time in Acts 2 where they had cloven tongues on their head. That was a one-time outpouring that they would speak with new languages. And the gift of tongues means I'm speaking right now in English, and everybody in the auditorium that spoke another language, you would hear me in your own language. That was the gift of tongues. I wish I had that. I wish I had the gift of tongues if I ran into someone that spoke Swahili or French or what have you, and I could speak to them in English, and they could hear me in their own tongues. And you find that in Acts chapter 2. And then in Corinthians 12, 13, and 14, if you put those three chapters together, you realize and recognize that, of course, tongues was an inferior gift. Prophesy. Prophecy was a better gift. So again, babble, we think about babbling and the tongues and so forth. I just want to clarify because young Christians get caught up. They get caught up with the tongues and, and people will confuse them. And uh, they will say to them, well, have you spoken tongues since you got saved? And uh, of course, it's confusing. So tongues were languages. And uh, we know that from the book of Acts uh, chapter 2 and then Corinthians 12, 13 and 14 as you read, read that trilogy together. So here is Babylon. Now the Babylon here, of course, again, Babylon began in chapter 10 of the book of Genesis, and now we've come all the way, all the way to the 21st century. So the two Babylons, here this angel is not stuttering, Babylon, Babylon. He's talking first of all about religious Babylon. We'll see that in chapter 17. Chapter 18 is material Babylon. And that, of course, we, we draw, draw back a moment and recognize that Rome comes into play. Chapter 17, we'll see, of course, the great whore and the great whore that sits on seven hills. Well, where are seven hills? We think about Rome. And, of course, Rome, remember, Rome has never really n not been. Uh, she has been hidden for a while, but she's never not been. And we look, of course, at Daniel, and uh, you see the the different heads that uh, Nebuchadnezzar, of course, had that vision and dream, and Daniel explained to him the final head, of course, the feet, partly clay and partly uh, iron, of course, is Rome. And Rome, of course, uh, comes back. And uh, during the time of the tribulation, Rome will be uh, preeminent once again. And, uh, of course, the great whore of chapter 17, none other than Rome and Rome coming again through the Antichrist. So Babylon, Babylon is fallen. So how is she fallen? She's falling, first of all, religiously. Remember, remember, Satan will incarnate the Antichrist. The Antichrist, of course, will be a political leader. Uh, don't, don't, doesn't the world now need a political leader? Isn't the world looking for a man? Well, of course, there is no political leader that can help anyone. The only man that can ever bring peace to the world of the Middle East, they crucified him. There'll be no peace on the earth until Jesus comes again. So if your candidate gets in or doesn't get in, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter, they're just people. And uh, people can't help you. Only the Lord can help us. And so as we realize that uh, this religious ruler, of course, will be the false prophet. The false prophet will give homage to the beast. And remember the beast, whoever doesn't worship the beast, uh, you won't be able to buy or sell. That happens in the middle of the tribulation. So in the middle of the tribulation, of course, beginning in verse 14, as we get to that, probably not this evening, but we'll see the beginning of the battle of Armageddon, uh, the Mount of Slaughter. And that will be when, when uh, Russia... Uh, Russia may de be deposed right now, but she's coming back. And she's going to come in to attack Israel. And then, of course, Egypt will come also. Now, Egypt is a third world nation. Egypt has never been a great nation because God destroyed her. And she's a third world nation. And so Egypt will come after the Jew. And, of course, other nations will be with that coalition. They'll come to the Jew. And, of course, God will take care of Russia Russia will go home 
with her tail between her legs, but she'll come back again in chapter 19. And then, of course, the Antichrist will come to Palestine because he's made that contact with the contract with the Jews, that seven-year contract, and he'll come and help her, and he'll defeat Egypt. And then all the world will say, man, he's not only great in economics, and he's not only great in wisdom, but he's a great military leader. Uh, let's all lay down our arms and follow him. And that's exactly what the Jews do. Remember, the Jews have lost no war since 1948, yet there's three more wars coming. And uh, so the Antichrist, of course, in the middle of the tribulation then, he'll break the covenant, he'll take off his mask, and then, of course, Satan will reveal himself. And, of course, that's found, of course, in the book of Daniel. And we'll see it here in the book of the Revelation. So, and there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. That great city, because she made all nations. Now, here's the consequences. Here's why she's going to suffer. She made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. That's not physical fornication. That's spiritual fornication. We'll see that when we get into chapter 17. That woman sitting on the scholar colored beast, of course, and that, of course, is Rome. Now notice the consequences and, uh, and how horrific and how horrible this is. I want you to find 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 for a moment, please. Verses 9 through 11 speak about the doom The doom of the earth dwellers. First Thessalonians. Now so many people get confused about the book of Thessalonians. And they think that second Thessalonians teaches that Christians are going through the tribulation. Well I feel sorry for them. I feel sad for them. Why? Paul says in 2 Timothy 2.15. Study to show thyself approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now you think about that. Rightly dividing the word of truth. How do we rightly divide the word of truth? Well, as a child of God, you have the Holy Spirit. John 16, the Holy Spirit, he brings us into all truth. He shows you error. Ever notice sometimes you get around some people and you feel, I'm not trying to be spooky here, but you get around some people and you just don't feel a spirit of camaraderie. You just don't feel that fellowship. Why? Because they're lost. Uh, lost people can't do anything to get to heaven. Lost people can't please God. Romans chapter 8 says, So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Romans 8, 8, 8, 8, 8. Uh, Lost people cannot please God. Lost people have no hope. Lost people have no joy. Lost people have no peace. They may have finances. They may have religion, but if they don't have Jesus, they don't have the peace of God. And if they don't have the peace with God, they'll never have the peace of God. And that's why the world is in such chaos. But notice 1 Thessalonians 2. So I'm not a child of wrath. I'm not a child of wrath. And uh, just before we go to chapter 2 Thessalonians, look just for a moment in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Chapter 5. Verse 7, they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that are drunken are drunken in the night. But let us, now watch the wording here, let us, that's save people, who are of the day, be what? Sober. Look at verse 5. Ye are the what? Children of what? Light, not darkness, light. And the children of the what? Day. We are not of the night, nor of the day. Look at verse 4. But ye brethren, that's talking about Christians, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Verse 3. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction come upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they should not escape, verse 8. But let us, who are of the day, be sober, sincere, serious, 
putting on the breastplate of what? Faith. Now you think about faith, hope, and love. Think about that. And works. Paul is the apostle of faith. Peter is the apostle of hope. John is the apostle of love. And James is the apostle of works. I'll give that to you again, no charge. So John is the apostle of love. Peter is the apostle of hope. Paul is the apostle of faith. And James, the apostle of work. So write in this one verse. But let us who are the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he that come to God must believe that what? he is, and that he is a rewarder to them that diligently seek him. So faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And notice, so the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. Not a wringing your hands hope. People say, and I did this last week, I still can't do it. They cross their fingers. My fingers are too short. <laughs> Thank you, Vicki. And uh, they say, fingers crossed. <laughs> well, I'm not going to cross my fingers or cross my heart. <laughs> Hope to die. And then you look behind their back and they have a finger crossed. <laughs> so uh, someone says, honesty is the best policy. No, honesty is the only policy. So faith and uh, love and hope. For God hath not appointed us unto what? Huh? Say it for me. Wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that rather we wake, again, I quoted 1 Corinthians 15, remember, we should not all sleep, but we should be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. So if the Lord doesn't come for another 20 years, I'll probably be gone. And uh, you could be gone too. But I'll just go to sleep. Sleep in Jesus. And uh, that's why John is saying in Revelation 14, uh, blessed and holy are those that have part in, uh, in the first resurrection, John 20 rather. But in, in Revelation 14, the patience of the saints. Patience. That's a hard thing, isn't it? Patience. Don't ever pay, pray for patience because with patience comes tribulation. So we're not the children of wrath, but we have obtained, of course, salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that rather we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Now watch this, verse 11. Wherefore, comfort yourself together and edify one another even as ye also do. Look at chapter 4, 1 Thessalonians 4. Remember, the people in Thessalonica were fearful that their loved ones would die and they'd never see them again. So Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13, But I would not have any big ignorant brethren concerning them which are asleep. Doesn't say dead, doesn't it? Doesn't say dead, it says asleep that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. Thank God we have a blessed hope. Go to a funeral of lost people and they want to throw themselves on the coffin. I've seen that. And they want to jump in the hole and uh, they have no hope. But we have hope in Christ. Yes, we'll, we'll tear up, we'll cry, and so forth. But we have the blessed hope. For if we believe that Jesus died, rose again, even so them which Sleep in Jesus, will God bring with them? We find that again in Revelation chapter 14. Those who sleep with Jesus. So you just die, you just go to sleep. And this we say unto you by the Baptist church. No, by the word of God. Thank the Lord for this book, the Bible. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain, so I'm still alive right now, I may look dead, but I'm alive, <clears throat> unto the coming of the Lord should not prevent them which 
are asleep. Why? I'm coming up from the ground. Six feet under, I got to come up a little bit higher. So we're not going before them. We're going to meet in the air. Notice what it says, verse 16. For the Lord himself, not an angel, not Michael, not Gabriel, not the seraphim, cherubims, but the Lord himself should ascend from heaven with a shout. Well, I was thinking about that this morning. Sure like to hear that shout. <laughs> sure like to hear that shout. And before a twinkling of an eye, I'm going up. I'm not going down, I'm going up. The voice of the archangel, wake up! People who always come to church late, I like to do something one time and put a bunch of shoes in here, <laughs> some clothes, and think they missed the rapture. <laughs> hey, where'd everybody go? <laughs> I'm left behind. I heard of a college student, that, a bunch of college students that doing that one time in their dorm, and they left their clothes and their shoes there. <laughs> Somebody had gone <laughs> to take a shower and came back in. They were all gone. <laughs> So the Lord himself, uh, by the way, I've already got my reservation. Amen. My name is written in the Lamb's book of life, never to be blotted out. Amen. I got my ticket's been punched. Amen. When he died on the cross, he punched my ticket and I made sure I got reservation. For the trump of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain should be caught up. That's where we get the word rapture. The word rapture is not in the Bible. Caught up, taken up, snatched out. Snatched out of what? The air. Who's the prince of the power of the air? Satan. He doesn't want us to go up. wants us to stay down. But we're going up. Amen? With them and the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And I have a point. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Here's my point, verse 18. Wherefore, do what? Comfort one another with these what? Words. Now, 2 Thessalonians, please. Chapter 2. I don't know why I did this. It wasn't in my message, but or in my notes, but... I guess the Lord wanted me to do this. And because so many people, somebody came to my office a couple days ago and uh, Sunday night at the search. People put their hands on their hip. They're in trouble. What do you believe about the rapture? Are you post, pre, mid? Where are you? I said, I'm going up. That's what I believe about. So pre-trib, what does that mean? That means I'm prepared. Prepared, pre-trib, pre-millennium. What's the millennium? That's the thousand year reign upon the earth. I'm pre-trib. That means I'm going up before the tribulation. You understand that? I'm going up. So here's the seven year tribulation. And uh, well, we'll make it just this long. Here's the seven year tribulation. Jesus comes this evening. I'm not going to get that wonderful salad my wife's planning to make. Okay. He comes tonight. I'm going up. Boo! And then... Three and a half years, Satan rules and reigns. Battle of Armageddon, seven years. Seven years is, is done. Satan is put in the pit. See the pit for a thousand years. And from here, all the way to here is 1,000 years. And we come back to rule upon this earth as kings and queens. Hallelujah. That's why we serve the Lord. And it's only for Wednesday night church people. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Only for Wednesday night church. And tithers. <laughs> well, it's for everybody that's saved. And then after the thousand year, Satan is loosed out of the pit, and you'll be amazed at how many people are going to follow him. They're going to follow him. Why? Because they'll not be able to stand before God and say, you know what? I was brought up in a bad, bad error. I didn't know about God. No, you're being brought up in the greatest time in history, and that is the theocracy. Jesus is reigning on the throne, and yet people will be deceived. So, again, you have the Satan, of course, deceiving those people. They're all riding down on Israel, and suddenly they turn their guns on God, Revelation 19, of course, and there's a battle, the final battle and conflict, and then chapter 21, 22, new heavens and new earth. Now, look then in chapter 2 of 2 Thessalonians. Now we beseech your brethren. Now, what's the significance of 1st and 2nd Thessalonians? They're the first chronological books in the New Testament. Oldest books in the New T Testament. And we have, we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, over and over and over in these eight chapters, 1st Thessalonians 5 chapter, 
2 Thessalonians 3 chapter, you have the word, he's coming, he's coming, he's coming, he's coming. Now we beseech you, brethren, again, Christian people, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our what? Gathering together, there is the rapture unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind, if you keep your mind fixed on the Lord, whatsoever things are true, Philippians 4, 8, which of things are honest, which of things are just, which things are pure, which of things are lovely, which of things of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, put your mind on those things. Amen? So keep your mind and heart fixed upon him. Or be troubled neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us that the day of Christ is at hand. Now that's good news. The day of Christ is really good news. The day of the Lord, Joel chapter three, is bad news, the day of the Lord. And that's what we will find in Revelation 14, verses 10 and following, we find the wrath of God. Let no man deceive you by any means. And here's where they get all confused. For that day shall not come except to be fallen away first, and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. They're saying that we're going to be here. The man of perdition, of course, is going to be the false prophet, the Antichrist. And we're going to be here. Uh-uh. Who opposeth. And by the way, that falling away there can be discussed. My opinion, that's talking about the falling away of God's people. The apostasy. That is God's people who are saved, truly saved, but not sold out. There's a difference. Saved, Savior, but not Lord. So they're not sold out. They're sometimes Christians. They're Sunday morning only Christians. Sunday night Christians. Wednesday night. But how about all the services? Ooh, you picking on me? Uh-huh. Shoe fits, put it on. They're not going to love his appearing. They're not, they're not looking for him. Reckon how many people go to bed at night and say, even so, come Lord Jesus. Reckon how many Christians get, go to, get up in the morning and say, thank you for a good night's sleep. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Spend time with Jesus. So we're all saved alike, but God knows we don't all act alike. And until Jesus is your Lord, you're up and down. Remember, your standing never changes. You're saved, never lose it justified but sanctification is another story up and down backslidden christians backslidden christian the most miserable person in the world is not a lost person because a lost person they don't know they're lost you understand they don't know they're lost but a backslidden christian is the most miserable person in the world why they used to read their bible they used to walk with god they used to pray and if you try to give them advice about doing right or living right they don't want to hear it and they'll be opposed to you. And they will tell lies about you. Why? Because they're not right with God. Breaks the heart of God. But notice. Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worship. So that he as God. This is the middle of the tribulation. Sitting in the temple of God. Showing himself that he is God. Remember Satan wants worship. Remember you not that when I was with you I told you these things. And now you know with withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now led it, that's the Holy Spirit, and Christians. Can you imagine the chaos in the world when we're gone? I'm talking about true, born again, sold out, chosen of God. Salt of the earth. Salt of the earth. Sunday mornings I'm talking, been preaching about the Beatitudes. But Jesus said, ye are the salt of the earth. What happened to Lot's wife? Remember, they're escaping Sodom. God destroyed that Sodomite city. Those two angels that came to Sodom, Lot's, <clears throat> the people of Lot, of Sodom and Gomorrah, those homosexuals, wanted to have their way with those two angels. And God, of course, destroyed, was destroying those cities. And those angels said, get out! 
Get out. And if, and if 2 Peter and Jude were not in the Bible, I would have never believed that Lot was saved. Because the Bible says that Lot, 2 Peter says, looking out the window, seeing the wickedness of the world, vaxed his, his righteous soul day by day. And that's what happens when God's people get away from God. They get indifferent. They get cold. They don't want to hear preaching for sure. They don't want teaching. They don't want to fellowship with God's people. In fact, if they see you, they go the other way. That's a horrible feeling. Go to the mall or go to a store, and there's some Christian people there that used to come to your church or used to fellowship with the Lord. They see you, they go the other way. Why? Because if you're right with God, you're a conviction to them. Why didn't God just save us and take us to heaven? Why does he leave us behind? So that we can be a testimony. You're the soul of the earth. You're also the light of the world. Soul is inward, light is outward. You're influence in the world. So those angels, those angels said, those Indians, those <laughs> angels said, flee. And what did Lot do? He said, now I want to go to another city. And, and those angels, now watch it. Those angels said, we cannot destroy until you get out. And God's not going to destroy the world and the tribulation until I get out. Until we get out. Amen? Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. So don't tell me I'm going through the trip. I'm pre-trip. Amen? I'm pre-millennium. Hallelujah. I'm waiting. My bags are packed. Because I already sent them up. Amen? Better be ready. Send them up. Send it up. Lay for yourself treasures in heaven, not on earth where moss and wrath doth corrupt, and with these break through and still. But lay for your treasures in heaven where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Amen? Better dig up that gold in your backyard. <laughs> I'm having a good time. I can't wait to go home and get that beet salad. No beets? Feta cheese, mixed lettuce, cucumbers, peppers, olives, extra virgin olive oil, balsamic vinegar. Mm, goodness. <laughs> Let's bow our head and close. <laughs> Let's just finish. <laughs> Let's finish. I'm not going up. I'm not making fun of folks. I'm just saying I'm going up. Amen. Can you imagine someone saying, wait a minute, I thought I was going to go through the middle of the tribulation. No, Lord, I don't want to go up. How stupid is that? <laughs> then there are people who are post-trib. That means you're not even going to go through the trip. <laughs> that means you're going to go through the trip and then go up at the rapture, then come back to the millennium. That, that makes no sense whatsoever. So pre-trib, that is I'm going up before the tribulation. Mid-trib, that is some folks say, we're going to go through. So I'm not going through any of it. You want to go through? Help yourself. And then there are ah, trip, no trip. So where do they get that? They sure don't get it from my Bible. Look at this, verse 7. For the mystery of inequity that already work, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked, notice the capital W, that's the person, that's the devil, be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, destroy with the brightness of his coming, even he, him, whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power, don't be duped by power, signs and lying wonders. So many people, I want to see it. Well, I don't believe half of what I see to you. I believe his word. Lying wonders with all deceivableness so, someone who lies to you doesn't like, love you. Proverbs 26. Someone who lies to you does not love you. Someone who flat out lies to you, they don't love you. Satan's a liar, isn't he? Father of lies. Revelation 14, 5 says those 144,000 are without guile. No corruption, no deception. With all deceivableness of unrighteousness, them that perish, why are they perishing? Because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Now watch it. And for this cause, what? They rejected Christ. God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. 
that they might be damned. Oh, this is hard language. Who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. But now why would we have this? Verse 13. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath in the beginning chosen you into salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief in the truth. Whereunto he had called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast, hold the traditions which you've been taught, whether by the word of God or the word of our epistle, this letter. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself, even God our Father, which hath loved us, hath given us everlasting consolation, that's comfort, and hope through grace, comfort your hearts, establish you in every good word and work. Shall we stand together? Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord for this book, amen? Thank the Lord for this precious book. Satan hates it, hates you. Why all the religion in the world? Because it's deception. Because there's a devil. And he doesn't want us to hear the truth. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. God, Jesus said, you should know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Free from what? Free from bondage. Second Peter talks about, in First Peter, talks about being purged. Forgotten, you've forgotten over and over in First Peter, rather. Peter talks about you have forgotten. Remember, remember, you've been purged. You've, you, you've been purged. You're, you're changed. You're a new person in Christ. Don't forget that. And Satan comes and says, now, get mad with your brother. They don't appreciate you anyway. Get mad at them. Get in your flesh. Have conflict. Have division in the church. Fighting in the church. Battling in the church. <clears throat> battling one another. Lose your testimony. It doesn't matter because God doesn't care about you anyway. And that's why God's people quit. They use that for an excuse. Well, if God loved me, why would I be sick? Because it's his will for your life. God loved me, why would I have financial difficulties? Well, maybe because you've been robbing him of your tithe, his tithe every week. Well, I'm in trouble. Well, how about you give to God? Be faithful. Give to him. Pay your bills. Pay yourself and pay others. But he's got to be first. Amen. Either he's first of all or he's not at all. Either he's Lord of all or he's not Lord of anything. So real Christianity works when we work out what God has worked in. So I'm going up, amen? Could be any moment. And you can be going up too. Let's bow, shall we? And Father, we, how can we not thank you for the gospel? That you would send an angel to proclaim to the earth dwellers who've had maybe opportunity to receive Jesus as their savior and they rejected him. Or they did as King Agrippa, Acts 26. Acts 26, almost thou persuaded me to be a Christian. Maybe in Acts 24, Felix, the governor, said when I have a convenient season, I will, I will call for thee. Did he ever get saved? Did Agrippa ever get saved? Lord, one of the biggest tools that Satan uses in his bag of trickery is procrastination. Put it off. Young people say, I want to party and enjoy myself, have a good time, live in sin and frolic and enjoy myself. And when I get old, then I'll come to church and serve God. No, 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 no. Only by your grace. And Lord, there comes a time when you draw that line. And Proverbs says, For I've called and you refused. I've stretched out my hand and no man regardeth. I will laugh at your calamity. When fear and desolation come, then shall they call upon me. But I will not answer. For they did not choose the fear of the Lord. Oh, oh, oh. How sad. How sad that so many procrastinate serving you. How wonderful when people get saved at an early age, have a lifetime to serve you. Thank the Lord for those that get saved later in life, but Lord, they have some baggage. And Lord, when you save us, 
You save our souls, not our bodies. And sometimes we have many scars upon these old tough bodies. But we thank you for free and full salvation that comes through the shed blood of your precious son, your precious son, given for us. Child is born, a son is given. The crucifixion, the substitutionary death of your precious son, dying in our place, going to the grave, defeating death, hell, and the grave. He didn't stay, he came up, hallelujah. Ascended to heaven, coming back again. Are we ready for him? Lord, we're only ready if our names are in the Lamb's book of life. Revelation 21, 27. If it's not in that book, we ain't going up. And we ain't getting in. So Lord, may we be challenged tonight about perfect and pure salvation. Heads bowed, eyes closed, nobody leaving. Please, for a few moments more. Is your name in the book? Is your name in the book? If, if your name is not in the book, you can have all the religion you want. And you'll fall like Babylon is going to fall in Revelation 17, the religious Babylon. You know the Lord Jesus as your Savior tonight. This 6th of January, if you die tonight, would you go to heaven? You know that for sure? Would you just raise your hand as a testimony? I'm saved. Heaven's my home. Just wave it at Jesus. I'm saved. Hallelujah. May take them down. But you're here tonight. Thank you for coming. Maybe you've been coming for an awful long time. But you've never really made a possession of salvation. I mean, there's been no change in your life. Preacher, would you pray for me tonight before you close out the message? I'm not saved. I need to be saved. Would you pray for me tonight? Here's my hand. God sees it in my heart. Here's my hand. I don't want to be a Christ rejecter. Pray for me. Pray for me as a Christian that I will have a life that's tasty, salty. Make people, salt, make people thirst for what I have as a Christian. I don't, I'm not certainly talking about material things. I'm talking about the peace of God. Pray for me tonight. Pray for me. I want to be a testimony as a Christian. I want to be a witness for Christ. Pray for me. Pray for me. And Father, we thank you so much tonight for this book. Thank you so much for the privilege to preach it, to teach it. But Lord, it's a tall order to live it. Help me, help we, help us to live it. Help us to realize every fleeting moment so many passes our way that we give them a testimony. By our hard work and labor, on not complaining, murmuring, as we learned Sunday morning, murmur, complaining, but that we have a good testimony. And Lord, we pray for our loved ones tonight that are not saved. Pray, oh God, that they'll listen to thy word. Pray that we'll be careful to pass out your devotions, your word. People in the privacy of their homes will read it. Pray the Holy Spirit will convict them. Pray they'll get saved. Lord, heaven's gonna be a terrible place for those of us who neglected to warn others about you in heaven that they could miss hell and they could have come to heaven. Help us to be effective in our witnessing is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Good night. Thank you for coming. If you